The Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There is much about the snake story in our Old Testament reading today that is curious and compelling. There are many questions that this story brings to mind. What's with the Israelites? How can they say in one breath that there is no food in the wilderness and then in the next breath say, we detest this miserable food? Did God really send those posing the snakes among the people? Or is it more the case that the Israelites were so helpless and uncertain that they needed to blame God for their troubles? How about that serpent on a pole? What kind of answer is that? And finally, if God wanted to help and save the people, why didn't God have Moses drive the snakes out of the campsite like St. Patrick is reported to have done with the snakes in Ireland? I am very much drawn to Old Testament stories, including this snake story from the book of Numbers. I have to say, though, that I am one of those people and I'm sure there are others here today who don't like snakes. And frankly, the idea of camping in the wilderness and being overrun by snakes, poisonous snakes at that, is about the worst stuff of my nightmares. The closest I've come to that wilderness experience with snakes happened one weekend in Rwanda. I had lived in Rwanda for two years and I had never seen a snake. And then all of a sudden, snakes came into my life over the course of three days. The first snake was in an old shed on the property where I lived. That snake was small. It was curled up in an empty bucket, and it probably fell from the roof beam into the bucket where it couldn't escape. I remember thinking, well, now I know there are snakes here. Later that day, I went with friends for a weekend of hiking in the National Forest in far western Rwanda. We saw two snakes while we were hiking, a green bush snake that was on the trail and a very long black bush snake with bright blue eyes that was stretching and slithering around a tree branch adjacent to the trail. An encounter with snake number four happened when we were driving back to our guest house on the main road through the park. The National Park guide who was with us in the car all of a sudden yelled, stop the car, stop the car. And so I did, right in the middle of the road. I had been glancing back in my rearview mirror because I saw movement on the road behind me, but no, the guide said that I had run over a snake. Now, this was in the National Park, as I said, and all creatures in that park are protected. So the guide was not happy that I had not seen that snake, 
and he was not happy to think I had killed it. So with my car sitting in the middle of the road, we piled out to take a look, and there, right underneath the middle of my car, was a big, bright, green snake, very much alive. The guide tried to poke it and to get it to move off the road. He tried and he tried, but that snake didn't want to go. And after a few moments of this, the snake decided, can you guess, to go up into the undercarriage of my car. We shook the car and we opened the hood to see if we could see the snake and we looked and we looked and we could not find that snake. And in the end, we had no choice but to drive on with the snake in my car, although I very carefully closed all of the vents inside before we started the engine. I never did see that snake again, thankfully, and I've always wondered what happened to it. But here's the thing that I appreciated about those snake encounters, especially the one at my car. My traveling companions were completely unfazed by it all. They didn't mind snakes. They even liked snakes. One of my friends was from a farming region in South Africa, and she said that snakes used to get in her car and in her house all the time. And the National Park Guide honored snakes as a part of the wonder of God's creation. And not one of my companions would ever think of killing the snakes that we came across. The fact that they were so curious and appreciative and non-anxious about snakes, even that snake in my car, definitely encouraged me to be non-anxious too. I think the Israelites could have learned from my traveling companions. The Israelites were anxious and afraid almost every step of the way from Egypt to the Promised Land. Grumbling was like a contagious infection for those people chosen of God. So every time we turn a page in the Old Testament, those folks were moaning and groaning and complaining about something. They muttered about the food and the water, and they muttered about why they ever left Egypt. They always seemed to be questioning God's purpose. They never could seem to remember that God had freed them from slavery and oppression. They never could seem to remember that God had promised them their own land, a land flowing with milk and honey. They could never seem to remember that God was traveling with them or that God loved and cherished them. All along the way, those Israelites were an anxious and forgetting people, a people who kept turning in on themselves and away from God. The King James translation of this story is somewhat more sympathetic to the condition of the people on that wilderness journey than the version we heard today. We read in verse 4 that as the people were on the way, they became impatient. The King James Version says, the soul of the people was much discouraged and weary because of the way. I find that a helpful translation. The soul of the people was much discouraged and weary. It reminds us that the way through the wilderness was not easy. It is little wonder that the people became weary and anxious. Little wonder that they were discouraged. Now, who among us hasn't had a discouraged soul some days? Some days are just soul-wearying days. On this, those soul-wearying days, this wilderness that we talk about, especially in Lent, is very real. And on those soul-wearying days, it feels like life is full of things that will bite and hurt us. But here's the thing for those Israelites. 
Instead of being honest with God and acknowledging their weariness and their anxiety, and instead of trusting God to continue caring for them, the people of God focused all of their energy and attention on everything that was not going the way they thought it should be going. They forgot God's saving action in the past. They lost sight of God's promises for the future. In the wilderness, those people of God lacked hope, they lacked trust, they lacked faith. They spent so much time complaining that they ended up running away from the very God who did not and would not abandon them. And here's the truth of this story. When the Israelites failed to act like God's chosen people, when they failed to keep the faith, when the Israelites got so caught up in their own anxieties and forgot who they were, then the greatest fears of the people came to life. Why did we come out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, they asked. And in the end, the very things that they feared the most came to life in the shape of those poisonous snakes. When Moses raised the serpent on the pole as an answer to the cries of the Israelites, God was calling the people to face their fears and to face their sin. God required the people to turn and to deliberately stop and look at that bronze serpent. God responded to the sin and anxiety and fear of the people by promising them life and healing through this image of the very source of their pain and death. By the mystery of God's grace and God's healing power, whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the bronze image and live. This odd little story from the book of Numbers has a lot of truth in it. At a gut level, I think we know that we can't run away from those things that we fear. We can't escape our anxieties. We can't also run away from the truth that we need God's help. Now the world all around us tries to tell us that we can do it on our own. The world tries to tell us that it's okay to find our own way and to live as if we're above it all. So we are encouraged then to go out and buy more things to fill our lives. We turn on the TV to deal with the silence. We have a few drinks to fill the hours. But when Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, God reminded the people what we must do to claim healing and life. We must face our fears, and we must face the facts about ourselves. We are a people in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. I think at this point about those people who are in recovery from addiction and the truths that they have learned. Those people who have come to grips with substance abuse know how essential it is to admit their own powerlessness and then to face the truth of their addiction straight on. It is only when we do that that healing begins. Here at Palm Lutheran Church, week after week, we come into the sanctuary and we are called by God to healing and to life. We begin each week by telling the truth about ourselves in the form of confession. And every time we come through those doors and sit in these pews, we can see the cross before us, where we are promised wholeness and life. For just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, so was the Son of Man lifted up in order that everyone who has faith in him may have eternal life. This cross hanging before us is a constant factor that we can count on amidst the anxieties and craziness in the wilderness of everyday life. I think of that old hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When we survey the wondrous cross, what do we see? 
There is beauty and mystery in this cross. And there is, too, the body of Christ, broken for us, hanging there, a sign of the world's sin and a sign of death. And in this cross hanging here, we are asked by God to face our fears, to acknowledge the brokenness and sin in our lives and in this world, and to face the reality of death. In the wilderness of the Old Testament, and here as well, God responds to our fears and our anxieties and our needs by delivering healing and love in that most surprising of ways in the cross of all things. And God calls us to see the cross with eyes of faith, and in that seeing to acknowledge that we are ultimately dependent on a higher and holy power. When we do that, God answers through the cross, reminding us time after time that pain and fear and death do not have the final word. As Moses lifted up that bronze serpent in the wilderness, so was Jesus lifted up. For God so loves the world that God gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, hear the good news. God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That is a story worth telling. Amen.